All right, so now we have Mark Miller talking about the science of great UI. Um, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, glad to have you out here with me. Uh, I'm Mark Miller. I work, work for, for DevExpress. Dev I am like ready to go right into my slides. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys and uh, see how this looks uh, for you guys over there, if you can see it. Looks like it's working. Um, so uh, science of great user interfaces and great design. We're going to talk about this uh, very quickly. I have uh, collected some of my favorite uh, guidelines. Uh, that's me right there wearing my, in my su super cool superhero look over there. My email's uh, in the bottom left and my Twitter handle's there as well, Miller Mark on Twitter. Um, I've been writing developer productivity tools for about 30 years. I've been researching uh, great design for about half of that time, about 16 years now. Uh, and I'm chief scientist for the IDE tools team at DevExpress. Um, the product that I spend most of my time working on is CodeRush uh, for Visual Studio. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, here's what we're going to hit. And I think we're going to hit these things pretty quickly. We're going to talk about emphasis and importance, contrast and readability, proximity and layout, borders and spacing, and fill and corners. So emphasis and importance first. So emphasis is the ability to make information appear important. Uh, and here are some of the ways that we can do this. Right, so it's to some degree, you could look at this and say, well, I can see that one way I could characterize this is saying, well, most of the text is reference is rendered uh, in one way, but portion of it is re rendered a different way. So that's one of the ways that we can do it is just by being different. Um, and we can also do things with contrast, saturation, shadow, that sort of thing. So emphasis is the ability to make information appear important. Keep this in mind as we move forward. Now, I know some things about some superheroes. Uh, I know about Batgirl, I know about the Hulk, I know about Scarlet Witch, and I know about Superman. Right? I know about their powers, and I know about their secret identities, and I know about their chances of beating me in a, a battle. And uh, let's organize the information that we know. So I'll create a, a table, and we'll put some columns, headers here uh, for the information. We'll put the uh, bad girl here, secret identity, Barbara Gordon, chances of beating me in a fight, 100%. The Hulk, main power is Hulk smash, secret identity, Bruce Banner, Chance of beating me in a fight, about 50% if I catch him on a non-Hulk day and I sneak up. Uh, Scarlet Witch and there's Superman. So this is the information that we have here uh, when we're talking about the things that I know. But the question here is, can we separate this presentation into two different groups of information? One of the groups, the high importance data, and one of the other groups, the low importance data. And I want to give you a second to look at this and think about that question. How do we separate this information into two different groups? And here's what I did. If you're looking at the text and thinking, well, which parts of the text are important and which ones are not, then uh, you're missing a really important concept. And the important concept is that everything on screen is information, even the borders, right? Even the background, everything on screen in an interesting presentation is, is information. And so the question is what's important and what's not is a good question to ask. Um, the reason why, well, we'll take a look at it as we move forward here. You'll see it in a second. Everything here in this table, if we zoom in on it, and going even closer, notice that the width of the border lines is equal to the width of the font stroke. Also notice that the contrast is the same as well for both of these. The contrast between the line or the text font, the text and its background is the same. It's black on white. So in this presentation that we have here, the emphasis is the same everywhere. Experiment, we might take the border lines and say, well, let's really emphasize those. We'll use two techniques. We'll use, will you keep a stick, the high contrast and we'll make them even bigger. 
And let's de-emphasize the other information which we identified as important by making it a little bit lighter and lower in contrast. And continuing the experiment in the opposite direction, we can create a table where emphasis matches importance. And then we can take a look at these three and ask ourselves the question, which one of these three is easier to read the data? And if you're like virtually everyone, you're gonna say the answer is this table down here, right? And in this table, emphasis matches importance. So earlier we said that emphasis is a way of making the brain think that information is more important, right? And, and we also said that everything on screen is information. Well, now what we can do is we can use this guideline, emphasis matches importance to create things that are uh, presentations that are easier to read. So that's guideline number one. Here's an example right here. I'm playing Yahtzee with the kids. We roll the dice out on a brown, brown dice on a brown table. And I'm like, wait, what? In low light. And I'm like, what did I roll? Uh, a better fix to this would be create dice that have high emphasis, such as this, the high contrast on the important information. Contrast and readability. So I've got a question here. This slide asks the question, does this text seem hard to read on top? And on the bottom, it asks the question, does this text seem easy to read? And again, if you're like most people, the answer is, yeah, the text on the top seems harder to read, and the text on the bottom does seem significantly easier to read. And the question is, why? If we extract the saturation, remove the saturation from this presentation, you'll start to see something kind of interesting. The text on top is, well, it's still there, but its perceived brightness is essentially equal to the brightness of the background. The takeaway here is that we're not reading in color. We're reading essentially in black and white on the perceived brightness spectrum. And what that means, the implication of this is, is that text needs to be high contrast in order to be easy to read, sufficient contrast from the background uh, on the black and white spectrum. So we want distinct text from the background in black and white. The next guideline, proximity and layout. Actually, I think I may have a couple things in here. The first concept is friends, enemies, and others. And so I've got a photo album here and I've got some pictures of some cute puppies and I just wanna organize them in my photo album. So I'm gonna put this one up here. And then I'm gonna take another, another look at the next photo and I'm gonna say, okay, where should I put that? And if you're like most people, intuitively, we're like, well, let's put it with the other one. So, okay, we'll move that over there. And let's look at another photo. Oh, more cute puppies. Okay, we'll put that right here. And then we'll take a look at another one of the photos I've got. And uh-oh, does it go over here? Or does it feel better? over here. And then if I've got this picture of a house, does it go with the puppies? Does it go with the cat? Or does it maybe go right here? Kind of an interesting example, but it's to illustrate a point that friends, information that is contextually related, feels better and is more readily uh, digested and understood when that information is close to other friends. And similarly, it's more easily understood when it's far away from the enemies. So that's what we wanna do. When we're looking at information, we wanna identify friends or closely contextually related pieces of information. Uh, and we wanna identify enemies as well. Here's an example in real life. Which button do I press to go to the 30th floor? I'll let you think about that for a little bit. And maybe you're thinking, okay, Mark, that's not fair. You zoomed in really close, right? I wanna see more. I'm like, okay, but you know, if you were blind, you'd just get what your fingers were touching, this would be it, but I'll give you more. Here's more. Which button do I press to get to the 30th floor? And now I think you may be starting to see the problem, right? One of these buttons is a friend of the label that's next to it. And one of these buttons is an enemy to the label that is on its other side. Right? In other words, the button to the 30th floor is the enemy of the 29th floor label. And yet they're equidistant apart. It's what I call a proximity violation. Right? So we want to follow that guideline. 
Here's another example. Which way to Fort Worth? Right? And here's an example where the enemies are close to the friends, right? So Fort Worth, the arrow pointing to the left, that's not for Fort Worth, that's for Justin. In fact, how many people do you want to bet came to the sign and they turned the wrong way? Because that arrow pointing to the left is so close to Fort Worth. Yeah. Kev Nick out there in the chat room says, geez, who couldn't figure that out? A um, couple ways to fix it. One is to follow the proximity guidelines. Put the friends close together. So put Fort Worth text next to its arrow. Uh, here's another way to do the same thing. Here's another th way we could do it, where we could keep things in the same place, but use a background color change to indicate which, how our, our friends are contextually grouped together. Uh, or we could use a line, a borderline. Out of all of these, the one in the upper left is my favorite because it's scalable for multiple cities and requires really no changes to any of the printing mechanics uh, for creating these signs. So there's the original, and there's our fix over on the right. So friends close, enemies apart. These are the proximity guidelines. Borders and spacing. So... I had this question a few years ago. The question is, well, I've got my text and I want to put a border around it, but where do I put it? I couldn't find any guidelines for this um, out in the real world. And based on um, my research, I still think there's nothing out there uh, that, that describes the answer to this question. I'll, I'll show you what I came up with. And this is based on a fair amount of research, including research in the way we recognize and understand the letters and actually the parts of the letters. Uh, those come from uh, something called the feature detectors in our brains. So when I say the parts of the letters, I mean the crosses and the curves and the endpoints. Uh, and here's what I came up with. Well, actually, before I show you that, I'll just clearly show you extremes, right? Sometimes I'll go to extremes when I'm researching a problem. Here's an extreme right here where it's just simply, it, it looks and feels too far away. And here's another extreme where it just looks and feels too close. So we know the answer is between these two. Uh, here's what I came up with. I take the distance of the space, the width of the space between two letters, and I multiply that by 1.5. And I simply add that to the, to the sides. <laughs> Excuse me. And I also add that up to the tops and bottoms as well. <clears throat> and that is the answer to the question. It's far enough away that our letter detectors won't be con won't ever confuse it for a potentially another letter next to the ending letters of the text or the beginning letters of the text. It's far enough away so we won't confuse that, which means our cognitive load is down, which means it's easier to read. Okay, um, but it's not too far away, right? So it's just in there at this nice, nice, uh, close distance. Now there are ways to get it even closer. For example, if I change the contrast of the line, notice I've still got it the same thickness. This line is as thick as the stroke width of the fonts. I can bring it in closer. I can also change the thickness. I can maintain the same uh, contrast uh, and just make it super thin or do both, make it both lighter in contrast, lower contrast, and make it thinner if I need to really get in tight. So those are two different ways to get, to kind of violate that rule. So uh, when I do this presentation in front of a live audience, I'm often, uh, I, I'll bring this slide up and I'll say, hey, what do you, which do you prefer? The one on the left or the one on the right? And virtually everybody says the one on the right. And I say, okay, which do you prefer here? Just doing our A-B testing. Everybody says the right. And I'm like, uh, which one do you prefer here? And around here, about 97% of, of the folks in the room, 95 to 97% say the one on the right still. And the takeaway here is that the, the guideline for borders is that they should be thin and low contrast. Call an example with the border. I've actually seen real examples of borders on real websites and other UI that have a thick, high contrast border. That's incorrect. That's the one on the right, sorry, the one on the right is the way to do it. Fill and corners. So I've got two stars in the middle of the screen 
And the question here is which star looks bigger, the one on the left or the one on the right? Uh, and if you are, uh, if you're like most people, you're going to say the one on the right looks bigger. In reality, they actually are constrained by the same bounding boxes, but the one on the right has got rounded corners. Uh, and as a result has about 34, 35% almost more pixels than the one on the left. Um, the, uh, the takeaway here is that if you want icons to be easier to see and you're constrained by, by the size of the icon, like in a particular box, like 16 by 16, use rounded corners for the icons. Uh, salience. So salience is a really kind of interesting topic. And, it, it, and the idea of salience is what does your brain consider important? Why is that an important question to ask when we're talking about good design? Because whatever your brain considers important, that's what you're going to kind of be, be working on, focusing on, right? And so the question is, with this particular shape, what do you find most important? Do you find the curve in the back? Maybe these curves in the front? Or this point right here? And if you're like most people, you identify this section right here as the most important part of this particular shape. The takeaway here, and it's supported by research, is that sharp corners are considered salient. In other words, we in naturally infer that they are important when we look at them. And if we do sharp corners and they're not really important, then we're kind of like, well, I'm not sure what's going on, and there's a little bit of confusion. Hollow versus, versus filled. So this question comes up, which is better, a hollow button or a filled button? And I start going through all the way different ways we can evaluate this. Um, for example, how many pixels are visible excluding the text? And with the hollow button, we've got about 1,000 pixels. And with the filled, we've got about 10,000. OK, how many shapes do we have to process? Well, for the hollow, there are two. You've got this kind of outer rectangle and an inner rectangle. You could argue that both of those have to be processed. Uh, and with the filled, you've only got one like that. Now you could also argue, well, wait, maybe it's not shapes, maybe it's just corners. How many corners do they have? Well, the hollow's got eight because this and this are both corners. And at some level, we're processing this inside of our minds, right? And if we're processing it, then you can argue cognitive load is a little bit higher. Whereas the filled's only got four corners. Peripheral image, and this is actually the most important, in my opinion, one, if not the most important, the second most important criteria. What does this look like when you're not looking at it? And here, the peripheral image kind of looks like this, because we don't have uh, acute uh, sharp vision in our peripheral vision. The filled looks like this, so we can still see it and identify it as a button. From my perspective, the one on the right is more desirable, uh, especially for an important button that leads me on the path to something critical that I'm designing the user interface for. For example, I might be designing the user interface for a website and clicking this button means uh, more sales or more registrations or more signups. The graphical message here is that the border is important, whereas here, the button is important. So from my perspective, filled wins all the way across the board, uh, all the way across um, uh, these different ways of evaluating. So the question of hollow versus filled, the answer is filled. So my conclusions are based on this research uh, is that when you have a choice between a hollow button or a filled button, the filled is the, is the better choice. If you, uh, uh, the only exception to this, I'm gonna stay on this for a second. The only exception to this is for a path that you maybe don't want the customer to take. For example, a cancel button, right? Or the less likely path. You might do something different or you might make it less uh, without saturation, for example. But in general, I would always go with a filled button and I'd use saturation like we've got over here in this example on the right and maybe no saturation uh, or a lower level of saturation for the less desired path. Corners, again, round corners are better because uh, we uh, corners are salient. And so we don't want to call attention to the corners. We don't want a button that says the corners of this button are, are important. We want a button that says the button is important. And then uh, with the call it example, 
that we saw before, not only do we not not only do we want to have a border that's thin and low contrast, but we also want to have a borders that are rounded, except for where we're pointing, because where we're pointing is important. That's the salient piece of this whole example. And so the better call out example is on the right. So corner sharpness needs to match the importance. All right, wrapping up. So I grabbed this example, uh, found this out there on the internet, and uh, I, there, there are a number of issues with this that are uh, that can be fixed. Um, and we talked about some of them here uh, in this session. Um, but one of the biggest issues is that of contrast. We have text that is low contrast on, we have essentially white text on a light background, and it's hard to read. It's maybe not so obvious when you look at it the first time, but when you go back and you look at the rules and you come back and look at this, you know, and or if you look at a side-by-side -side of something that's essentially the same interface but redesigned using the guidelines, you can start to see, oh, okay, I'm getting it, right? I'm getting to see that the one on the right is far more easy to consume the data in than the one on the left, right? And so there are these are some of the guidelines. Like I said, this is a very fast, uh, co condensed course. Uh, there's more out there, um, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. I, I want to summarize everything we've talked about, though, up to this point. Uh, what we've learned, every on-screen element is information, but not every element is equally important, right? So understanding and taking a moment to ask the question, what are the most important pixels on screen or dots of ink in the presentation? Uh, and uh, and what, are, uh, what are the most important and what are the, least, the, the, the ones of lower importance? Emphasis should match element importance. For readability, we need sufficient contrast on the perceived brightness spectrum. That means black and white. Physical proximity should match contextual proximity. That means friends should be close and enemies should be enemies of the friends should be kept far apart. Borders should be thin and or low contrast and no closer, in, this is a guideline, than 1.5 times the space, space width. And you can break that guideline if you go super low contrast on the border or you make it super thin. Get it closer if you need to. Buttons should be filled and unimportant buttons can be filled but with a lower contrast against the background. Corners should be round except for important corners which can be sharp. Where can I learn more? Uh, there's a website out there called sgui.com. It stands for Science of Great UI. Uh, that's a site I've got out there. It's mine. Uh, and uh, I've got a, a, a free course out there that you can sign up for by email uh, to learn more. Um, also, if you go to deviq.com, you can uh, get uh, uh, the full-on Science of Great UI course. And we've got a free offer for co .NET conference viewers, courtesy of DevExpress. Uh, everybody who's watching and who goes to this URL between now and tomorrow night, the 26th of September at midnight GMT, can get a free copy of the product I work on, Code Rush. If you, you work in Visual Studio, this may be of uh, use to you. And uh, with that, I believe I'm done. And you can uh, we can uh, answer questions. Hello, and we're back. Uh, so this was an awesome talk and the feedback on the stream has been awesome. Like I think not only myself, but everyone yeah. included was learning lots of things about UI, which we get to, um, we don't get to think about it every day. So really cool. Uh, some people were asking about if you're going to share uh, your slides they want to share with students and things like that. So. Are you going to post it somewhere? <laughs> I am not going to do that. Um, I have like a, uh, uh, I would suggest instead going to the SGUI.com. You can get material there. Uh, and uh, sometimes I'll give away a PDF at conferences. I'm going to be speaking at Dev Intersection coming up. I've got a like a full day workshop. I think there maybe. Uh, and I know I've got three courses there as well. And so people can come to those as well if they want to get those those PDFs that I give away. Cool. Well, but people will be able to watch this video on YouTube and Channel 9 later, so... They can certainly do that. All right. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, and it was really a great talk. All right. Thank you.